Hello everybody. Hello YouTube. Hello art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M. And I'm back with yet another video. Uh, this time I'm going to... Uh, I don't know how long this is going to last, but I'm going to try to analyze those photographs I told you about that the dude on Twitter uh, put up from the Tashin book, the one that cost $1,500, the one that I can't afford, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to justify spending that much money on one book, but never mind that. Hopefully, they'll, like, some, some wonderful person will put it on archive.org one day, and then I'll be able to look at it. But, <clears throat> um... Never mind all that. Today, but today I'm gonna go and look at those photographs uh, that the dude put up, and I'll put the link to the guy's uh, tweet, so you can look at his tweet and his account and his all of his tweets uh, uh, for yourselves. He tweets a lot about movies, all different kind of movies, not just The Shining. But <clears throat> um, I want to look at the photographs, and I want to kind of think about them, and I want to do that uh, with you all. And again, I don't know how long this video is going to be. Hopefully not too long. I'm working on a couple of different things. I'm, like I said, I'm going to have to start taking notes from all my past videos. And like do like a running list of stuff that I want to talk about or mention or analyze or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and also, I am still working on the Colorado Lounge thing. And I've discovered some interesting stuff. Can't wait to tell you. But I th again, I think I'm gonna wait until I do. I just, I just two days ago got done with part 15. I don't know if it's like one of my better videos or worse videos, but you know, I tried. I tried. I, I, again, understanding the shining is more or less just about giving those of us who are shiners like time to just really, really, really analyze each and every scene and, you know, in f almost frame by frame, just look at all the objects, items, things, um, and give us, give us the luxury of time to like, just think about what they might mean and why they're there. Why did Stanley put them there? Um, but my like film analysis with, with regard to The Shining, that's different. That's me actually like trying to do something. With Understanding The Shining, it's me just kind of mapping things out or just putting them up for your consideration so you can kind of think about them or whatever. Um, thank you for all your comments. I appreciate them so much. And since I just said that, let me go ahead and do church announcements. Um, returning viewers, Thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new. Subscribers, thank you for subscribing. Um, I appreciate each and every last one of you. And all of you, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share uh, my videos if you know somebody who might enjoy my nonsense. Um, and that's about it for church announcements. The community tab has been... I, I, I went ahead and I did a lot this week. Um, art history playlist... I found some really nice, really nice free books to read and look at on archive.org. So go ahead and take a look. Um, yeah, I put up, uh, for some reason, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, because I do think Mike Patton is the Stanley Kubrick of like modern music. So I put one of my favorite performances that's pretty easy to find online, uh, from Mr. Bungle. Another like cute video. None of them knew they were robots more books, and so on and so forth. I already covered, you know, Black Lodge. That's going to be very important soon. As soon as I get through with, like I said, when I finally do part 16 and we're done with that scene in the Colorado Lounge, I can finally talk about the Colorado Lounge. I, again, I've been kind of fixating and concentrating on that room a lot. And I'm, I, maybe like, I would like to, or or maybe it would be more appropriate for me to wait until I'm done with every single last one of my Understanding the Shining installments. But no, I can't. I, I, I'm so impatient. I want to tell you as soon as possible. So, but, but I promise after part 16, then 
I'll get into the Colorado Lounge and really, really get into what I think is going on with that room and what Stanley is trying to do or tell us or whatever. I'm working on that. I'm working on the number 42. I've discovered just, just this evening, I've discovered some very interesting stuff that might just blow your mind. We shall see. Um, but like, <clears throat> let's let me get to like why I'm really making this video today. I have no idea what I'm going to title it. Nothing. Let, but just let's get right into it. Okay. So here we go. Here's the first shot from the pictures from the book um, that the, the dude posted on Twitter. <sighs> it is a photo of Stuart Ullman in his big coat with the fur lining um, and he's carrying obviously a box of roses. I don't know how many roses, but there are roses. And I've talked about this before. I've talked about like the epilogue scene and, you know, the availability of the, those grainy pictures that have been around for quite a while online. These are much better pictures. These are full color pictures. Um, you know, Stuart Ullman, he's dressed to impress. Right? He's wearing a tie. He wasn't wearing a tie or a suit on closing day of the Overlook Hotel, for example. He was wearing those red pants. You know, he was he was dressed for, like, fun on that day. Here, he's like, he's all business here. The tie should tell us something. And again, roses are red. There's It seems to be some red going on um, under his jacket for his suit. I don't know what to think black tie okay and again this <sighs> i've been saying forever i've been saying for a whole year that i think the overlook hotel is a brothel and i think that Stuart allman is the manager not of a hotel really but more of a, a brothel i think he's a pimp to me this coat and the fact that it's you know fur is flashy make no mistake it's always been flashy it's that's always been its purpose to look luxurious and expensive um and it is associated with those kinds of people you know pimps so you know there's that and he look he has this look on his face he's i don't know if this is i mean is this a still photograph from the footage that you know the epilogue footage that got cut out or or what but he looks nervous to me there seems to be like a little you know his facial expression there seems to be this sense of trepidation uh as far as whatever's going on let me enlarge this so you can like get a good look at his face wow right wow and then in the background i think that's like the receptionist nurse and i think this you know darker uh part here that's danny sitting next to the nurse um when he walks in right when Stuart walks in, and this is, uh, he's, I think he's just walked into Wendy's hospital room, you know, um, which I'm wondering, I'm wondering so much about this. Just looking at this one frame, we know what happens in the last part of the movie. We know that we, what, what we see is Jack busting into the, uh, apartment, their apartment in the hotel through the front door, and then he busts in through, the bathroom door and Wendy's in there screaming her head off and um you know she gets a knife and she whacks Jack on his hand and she can't get out through the window Danny's the one who gets out through the window and you know Jack is distracted by Halloran's arrival and then he goes downstairs and um he kills Halloran and whatever and Wendy just you know runs around the hotel looking for Danny like the first place she runs is upstairs makes no freaking sense um <clears throat> and you know danny i guess it could be argued kind of suffered a little bit more <laughs> than wendy in that whole like last part of the movie he's the one who slid down that big pile of snow uh, up against the external wall of the hotel and then he can went back into the hotel and he hid in that stainless steel cabinet and then he got out of the cabinet and started running so that jack would chase him and then he ran outside and jack runs after him into the maze and then he 
uh, gets Jack to get really deep into the maze, and then he uses his own footsteps to find his way out of the maze, and there's Wendy, and oh, they hug, and then they get in the snowcat, and they drive off, and I guess obviously they end up in this hospital. I don't know how they end up in the hospital, but they end up in the hospital. Okay, so Danny has been through a lot, if we're just going to go by the surface of what we see in that scene, or those scenes at the end of the movie. Okay, but, you know, Danny's not the one in the hospital bed, it's Wendy. Okay, so here's the second one. Uh, here, at least I just want you to get like a shot of the full thing. Here he is, right? Stuart with his flowers. Okay, and like I said before, when I, I think I found one photo of this somewhere on Instagram. Maybe I should look for more of these from the Tashin book on Instagram. I don't know. But look at this setup here. Look at this. I mean, there's this glare up here, so whoever took a photo of it, is, is a, there's a glare, I guess, from the light um, on the photograph, not in the photograph itself or in the scene. But there she is. She's not hooked up to anything. She's not hooked. She doesn't have an IV drip or anything. She's just kind of hanging out in the, um, in the hospital bed. And I've talked about her colors in the movie. I said blue is Wendy's color. Blue and red. Okay, here we are. The bedding of the hospital bed. This is a nice hospital. Um, you know, this, these, the blue sheets, blue pillowcases, blue sheets, and then the blanket on top of the sheet is like this kind of pastel, uh, pink color. And so, so are her pajamas. That's, that's, and that's the thing. She's pink, like I keep saying, pink is just a, a light version of red. Okay? But it's still red. You can't have pink without red. You mix white and, and red to get pink. And and her hospital, it, uh, her um, her pajamas, her, her nightgown or whatever this is. And that's why I said nightgown. This is not a hospital gown. This is not like those that thing they give you when you get hospitalized, like that horrible thing that doesn't close in the back and everybody can see your backside if you get up and walk around. No, this is nice. This is not hospital issue um, pajamas. No, this is really, really, really nice. Are these her own clothes? Is this her own, you know, Wendy's? Is this Wendy's nightgown? Is this, are these her pajamas? Whatever it is. Which makes me wonder. Like, that makes me wonder a lot. Like, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't remember. I, I mean, in the 80s, early 80s, I remember visiting people in the hospital. They all had hospital gowns on in the bed. Like, I don't remember seeing anybody in their own pajamas in the hospital. And that makes sense because, like, the nurses and doctors, like, if they have to come see you in your hospital bed and do stuff to you, like, those hospital gowns are much more practical. They they have easy access to whatever part of your body they need to work on or whatever. Wearing wearing a nightgown or pajamas like this makes the nurses and, and the doctor's job that much harder. So what the hell um doesn't make sense she's somebody in the comments of this tweet that where the guy posted these photos um remarked and very rightfully so that wendy is wearing her wedding ring and you can see it right here she's still wearing her wedding ring even i mean that is that significant would she take it off right away um, you know, we do have like some dialogue for this scene, like that exists. <clears throat> they, the, the dialogue doesn't mention Jack. It doesn't mention whether he's alive or dead. I think the dialogue mostly says like it's Stuart saying that they went through the hotel and they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. They didn't find anything out of the ordinary. So that's what causes me to question, like, did Jack really die? 
I don't know. I just don't know. Um, but you know what she did take off? She's keeping her wedding ring on, so that means Jack might not be dead. And, but she did take off her watch. That watch that I said in the beginning of the, of the movie when she's with the doctor woman and everything that she wears outside of her sleeve on her wrist. That it's right there on the side table right next to the phone. Um, and then there's some, I don't know what the hell these things are back here. These, are they, they some kind of hygiene products? Are they lotion? I don't know what they are, but there, there's that. There's the phone. Ooh, that does have a cord. That's, uh, yeah, we have a lot of cordless stuff in The Shining, but not this phone. Uh, and the watch is right there. Okay. And what? And, and there's a bouquet. All right. There's a bouquet. So somebody has already visited her. I don't know if we, I don't know who it could have been, but somebody already visited her and obviously already brought her some flowers, not just flowers, but roses. Okay. Flowers are one thing. Bringing a sick person flowers, like in a hospital or whatever, that's one thing. And that's what a lot of people do when somebody's sick, either in the hospital or if they're sick at home. You bring them a nice bouquet, you know, or like a cute little potted plant or something like that. But roses, roses, that's heavy. You don't bring just anybody roses. You bring, you give roses to somebody that you, that you love you know, and somebody already brought her a bouquet of red roses, and here comes um Ullman with what looks like, at least to me, some more roses. I mean, if they're not roses, then what are they, like red chrysanthemums? I don't know, but she's still, what basically my point of this is, she is still wearing her colors, even in the hospital bed. The bed is her blue, you know, Wendy Blue is the color of the bed sheets. The blanket is pink, like maybe kind of a, a musky, darker pink, but it's pink. And her pajamas, her nightgown, also pink, which is, you know, also known as light red. What the hell is going on? And the way she's looking at him. ay ay ay. I don't know what to make of this facial expression that Shelley Duvall has in this in this shot. I really don't. But... I don't know. She doesn't. Why? You know, Danny's running around the hallways, hanging out with the nurse at the reception desk, and here she is looking just tragic. I don't know what's going on. I really don't know. But that's why we're here, right? To kind of try and figure it out. So, <clears throat> here he is again. Ullman. Um, I think those are roses. Hold on. Let me, yeah, I think they're, they're roses in this box. And now she's holding them. She's cradling them like they're a child. Okay. That is one thing. Oh, and now in this other, look at this. Look at how the color changes. This looks much redder in this, um, uh, these, these roses that somebody already brought her look to me anyway. Even despite the glare, they look much redder in this shot than they do in this shot. Interesting. And also, we see like these, I don't know, like products here, the phone, and you can see this glimmer here. That's, that's the watch. Um, and then there's this box thing that we don't see from this angle, and it's close enough. The box thing, which I'm assuming is probably Kleenex or something, but it's, it looks close enough to the phone so that you should be able to see it in this shot. It should be about right there, but we can't see it, so I don't know what's going on. And then there's an empty, like, water glass. Interesting. And again, she's, she's in the, in the hospital bed. Pink nightgown, pink blanket, blue bed sheets. No watch. <sighs> what is the message behind that? Which I can't pick up on right away. And again, Omen looks anxious. You know, he's... I'm telling you, and I, th I think I said this in to Exorcist Reviews in the uh, DM on, on Instagram. I think... If you're listening, Exorcist Reviews, like, I think Omen is trying to make a move on Wendy. 
he knows like whether whether jack is alive or dead doesn't matter like elman knows that that marriage is basically over like for whatever reason elman seems to know he knows that there's nothing at nothing wrong at the hotel there's nothing out of the ordinary at the hotel after everything we saw in that movie he's traced there's no dead body there's no like pots and pans and whatever that that jack um scattered all over the place when he was just acting crazy walking down that hallway um there's no busted out door you know the 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 bathroom door and the front door of their apartment hasn't been busted out with an axe um what else like they didn't find you know did they find jack's novel all work and no play makes jack a dull boy over and over and over again i mean pfft, nothing out of the ordinary seriously okay cool um but for even whether if there's nothing out of the ordinary they didn't find anything out of the ordinary according to ullman in the dialogue between him and wendy in this scene it doesn't matter that marriage is over like we know that something was wrong with that marriage and that it's no good and whether jack's alive or dead it's done it's done and ullman is taking advantage of this opportunity to make a move on wendy i remember telling you guys when they were doing the walk through the, the camera walk of the hotel where omen and watson are giving the torrances um a tour of the hotel and like i told you that wendy seems to be flirting with Stuart ullman she just she, to me it sounds like she was just turning the charm up to like 10 laying it on really thick asking all those dumb bimbo-y questions <sighs> to me it seemed like she was flirting with him and i mean allman wasn't really flirting back because i guess it would have been uh what you call it inappropriate for him to do so right in front of her husband jack but and i'm also looking at this painting not painting but this print on the wall if any of you know what this is on the wall in her hospital room um tell me because i can't make it out all i can tell you is that it's pink it looks pink to me in this um in this photo and then there's a light oh good heavens let me zoom out there's a light it seems like this is a light above Wendy's hospital bed that is not switched on. Okay. It's dark. It's, it's just a black hole. I can't even see a light bulb. Again, remember the movie is called the shining. And if this light above her hospital bed don't even have a light bulb in it. So that means it can't be turned on. Um, mm. And again, I think that light symbolizes not in, in general, light symbolizes knowledge. And especially in this movie, it's called the shining. Like I said, how, what shines something that reflects or emits or uh, emits or reflects light. That's what shines. There's nothing in this lamp above her bed. I assume that's a lamp. What else could it be? Um, and again, we have this Kleenex box. At least to me, to me, it looks like a Kleenex box. Why is it there? Okay. And again, Allman just looks like a very anxious suitor, um, there to call on, uh, Wendy. And he's like, he's like a vulture. He's just taking advantage of this opportunity. You know, to me, that's what it looks like to me. He's one of those like grimy guys who take advantage of women when they're in a weakened state. Of course he is. Of course he does that. If he's what I think he is, uh, you know, a pimp who manages a brothel. Jesus Christ. Anyway, so that's that. So they're having this conversation. Again, he looks concerned, but nervous and anxious. Not necessarily because he's worried about how she is. She's obviously fine. Um, he's, he's trying to, again, make a move on wendy that's what the flowers are for that's what the roses are for okay and obviously somebody else has been trying to make a move because even these are even though these are not red they're still roses that's that's a romantic gesture in my opinion okay so 
you know, there's that. There's that. So let's go. Let's move on to the next one. This is the script. Okay. This is the a picture of the script. Uh, for the, and, uh, Kubrick's newly written scene for the ending begins with Ullman walking forward. Um, walking forward and stopping at the reception desk where the nurse and Danny are playing a board game Snakes and Ladders. Ullman finds Wendy in her room and says, Oh, about the things you saw at the hotel. He told me they've really gone over the place with a fine-tooth comb, and they didn't find the slightest evidence of, any, of anything at all out of the ordinary. Mrs. Torrance, I think I know how you must feel about this, but it's perfectly understandable for someone to imagine such things when they've been through something like you have. You mustn't think about it any more. Have you decided where you're going when you leave here? Holy shit! I mean, like, oh my freaking God, what the hell? They didn't find the slightest evidence of anything at all out of the ordinary. I just talked about that like a minute ago. They've really gone over the place. And I think when Ullman says they, I think he means like the police. They've gone over the place with a fine tooth comb. They would have noticed the destroyed doors. They would have noticed the dead body. They would have noticed the stuff all over the floor in, in that, like, service hallway. They would have noticed a dead body in the maze. I mean, or, you know, those footsteps leading to the maze. They would have noticed that, you know, that scene where Jack um, takes those parts out of the radio in Ullman's office and, you know, he, cause he threw the thing on the floor. They would have noticed that, um, you know, the snow cat in the garage, uh, had had like w whatever part cut out of the engine, like the carburetor or whatever that was that, that Wendy was holding when she runs into the garage where the snow cat, they would have noticed all that shit. They would have noticed all that shit. And he, he, Ullman is telling her, no, they, they've they gone over the place with a fine-tooth comb. And they didn't find the slightest evidence of anything at all out of the ordinary. And look at what he says to her. Mrs. Torrance, I think I know how you must feel about this, but it's perfectly understandable for someone to imagine, to imagine such things when they've been through something like you have. But they don't talk about what it is that she's been through. They don't say what it is that she's been through, but he's telling her, like, all that, he's basically telling her to her face, Mrs. Torrance, you imagined all that shit, and none of it really happened. I mean, he's all but calling her crazy. I, 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 I don't know what to say. I mean, other than, I mean, he says it all right here. There's nothing out of the ordinary. It's perfectly understandable for someone to imagine such things when they've been through something like you have. Like, what has she been through? If nothing is out of the ordinary at the hotel, there's no dead body in the lobby, there's no dead body in the maze, there's no stuff all over the place, there's no busted up doors or, or whatever, nothing. Then, like, what, what, what has she been through if there's nothing out of the ordinary at the hotel? Do you, you see why I'm confused? I'm confused. Okay. And he asks her, have you decided where you're going when you leave here? Wendy says, no. Okay. So now here, here's Ullman making his move. Mrs. Torrance, I'd like to take the liberty of suggesting that you and Danny come and spend a while at my place in L.A., at least until you get your feet on the ground. It would be great for Danny. It's right on the beach, like I told you. I don't care what era, what decade you're talking about. I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Beachfront homes. Okay? Beachfront homes. Anywhere in L.A. County. But, like, I'm assuming that he lives in a place like Hermosa or Manhattan. Or maybe even Malibu. I don't know. Um, th those houses have always been expensive. Yeah, never mind inflation or whatever living like right on the beach or like within walking distance of the beach. When I say walking distance, I mean a mile. Okay. Those are expensive neighborhoods. 
trust and believe trust and believe and they're not very big how i mean they are but they're not ugh. like ugh. I, I i don't want to get into it like real estate down here is a mess but trust and believe those are expensive homes and f oh fucking ullman can afford one of those houses that means that whatever he does at this hotel he gets paid big money for it big enough so that he can live in los angeles on the beach in the off season okay he can spend his winters in los angeles i don't even know why he has a coat like this if he if he if he lives in la <laughs> during the winter i mean i don't know i just don't know but anyway um and he 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 offers that to her and i guess that's it she he doesn't even give her a chance to answer and then he walks to the reception counter okay and then ullman says to danny he says oh danny i forgot to give you this catch he throws a yellow ball to danny and then ullman says see you tomorrow danny ullman leaves hold on danny okay and that's this no that's not this that's this okay that's this I'll enlarge it. So here he is. He just gave him the ball. And I I was talking like that damn ball in some shots or in some, I don't know what to call this, in, in the movie, the ball is yellow. And in some of them, the ball is pink. In my copy that I use for my understanding the Shining episodes, it's pink. And see all these little cars that, that in this one are yellow? In this one, they're pink. I don't know if that's deliberate on Stanley's part or what. I, I really don't freaking know. Y'all help me out. You tell me. And I'm still working on the plaid. I need to figure out the plaid. Um, and again, the pattern in this hallway, the central part of, e you know, the, the, these patterns is this red hexagon. One, two, three, four, five, yeah, six. Hexagon. What the hell is going on? What the hell is going on? But anyway, let's get back to here. Okay. So he throws Danny the ball. The ball that Jack was throwing in the... Oh, in the Colorado Lounge. In the lobby where I, I do my video about all the Z's. Okay. Where is it? Yeah. Uh, film analysis, the shining symbolism, get your Z's at the Overlook Hotel. Okay. And where else does, um, and, and here in this scene, this is the last place that we see the ball. Okay. This is where he gets up and goes into room 237. So Alman, you know, they've been through the hotel with, what does it say? A fine tooth comb. They sure have. They sure have, they sure have really gone over the place with a fine tooth comb because, um, you know, where is it? They find this ball. They've been through everything. And what, like, what does that mean? What does that mean? So the ball is real. When we see Jack throwing the ball up against the wall and, and bouncing it in the lobby and everything, that ball is real. Right. Now we're back to the, we're, you know, I said there's the reality after, uh, closing day, after the camera walk on the, on the closing day of the hotel. And then there's, you know, like I said, the camera walk establishes the baseline for reality in the world of the movie. Um, you know, in, in this place, in this hotel, everything after that ain't no telling whether what whether or not what you're seeing is real but the camera walk is supposed to give you like an idea of where everything should be in the hotel right that includes all the rooms that we see the lobby the colorado lounge the gold room um the kitchen their apartment everything okay uh the only part uh the only part this is interesting now i'm just thinking of this the only part of the hotel that we don't see uh, during the camera walk, the tour that Ullman gives them that, that we don't see during the tour is the, you know, the area, room 237, the hallway in front of it. We don't see that. 
and we also don't see um, that bathroom with Grady and Jack, all, all the red in that bathroom. And we also don't see the boiler room where Wendy is when she hears Jack yelling upstairs, having a bad dream. I, I can't think of any of the uh, other ones. But, okay, so there's, I just had that thought, and I thought I would share it with you. Okay, so, Ullman leaves, hold on Danny. Okay, cool. And then we switch over to back to the hotel, interior lobby. Tracks past furniture covered in dust sheets to picture on background wall. Fade into this title over black. So it's a picture of Jack in a tuxedo at a party, and it says uh, whatever. What was it? Like, is it New Year's or 4th, 4th of July, uh, 1921? Okay. And he's in black and white, and that's that's this enigmatic, mysterious image of him. And it says the Overlook Hotel would survive this tragedy, as it had so many others. It is still open each year from May 20th to September 20th. It is closed for the winter. The end. Okay, so what did I say? September, May. Uh, September is the ninth month of the year. May is the fifth month of the year. So you're telling me 9 minus 5 is 4. You're, t you're telling me that this hotel is open only four months out of the year? And it says it's closed for the winter? I didn't know winter lasted eight months. Am I missing something? September is the ninth month. May is the fifth month. 9 minus 5 is 4. So May through May 20th through September 20th. That's four months, almost exactly. Four months time. So you're telling me it's closed for eight months, and that that those eight months are all winter. Okay, all right. I I don't know what to think. I really don't know what to think. Um. Mm mm. Mm mm. No no. No no no. This, this just, you know, this, everything I've been talking about and everything everybody else has been talking about, not just me. I'm not the only person who does shining videos or shining analysis. Like, I don't think any of those people, including me, um, have ever been able to successfully, like, figure this out. I am trying as hard as I can. And I want you guys to try too. But, mm -mm, this part, like, you think, I thought, you know, maybe Stanley left this part out of the movie because it would just give the whole thing away. It kind of does, but it kind of doesn't. I don't know why he... There, I, obviously, there's a lot of stuff that he left out. He decided that what we now see and what we now know as the movie is what he wanted people to see that was his decision and his decision was to cut this part out this part the the hospital thing the epilogue thing might give us a lot of insight into all the other stuff that we do see in the finished movie that he wanted everybody to see but it still doesn't answer every question it sure doesn't it to me it kind of reinforces what I already think. I don't believe Jack is dead. I don't believe that Halloran is dead. Um, I don't believe there are any ghosts. I do believe that Wendy is crazy. Um, I don't necessarily subscribe to the Wendy theory. I know some like folks were um, kind of going back and forth in the comments about like the Wendy theory. Um, no, I don't 100% agree with the Wendy theory. Like I've, I think I've said this before, so I don't think I'm contradicting myself. I think it's a good start, but I also think that the Wendy theory is basically plagiarism. Whoever put it up there, you know, Rob, whatever his last name is, um, who put up the Wendy theory, I think he stole it from somebody else because it was, it was around, there was on the internet. You can, I think in one of my videos, I even linked to the blog where I found like the orange, the well, I'll call it that, just for the sake of convenience. The original Wendy theory, where this blogger, I think named Kevin, 
um, talks about like the, what's really going on in the movie is that Wendy is batshit crazy. And I think that Rob, what's his face, uh, with the Wendy Theory video, I think that they at least partially copied that Kevin person. That's what, that's what I think. That's what I think. So Rob, what's his face? Plagiarist. I mean, if you had any doubt as to how I feel, now you know. Now you know. So the Wendy Theory, again, I don't 100% agree. I don't even agree with Kevin. Kevin's like, ooh, there's, there's a lot in there. Go through my videos, find it, look for it. You know. Um, but there's something up with the Wendy character. Everybody has always thought of her as this, you know, poor, poor lady who's a victim of an abusive husband and an abusive situation who's unable to stand up for herself. Stephen King himself said that, that Stanley, uh, made her this, you know, it, it's a misogynistic character as opposed to his strong Wendy from his novel, My Ass. But whatever. And no, Wendy, Wendy is so much more than what meets the eye in the movie, in my opinion. Um, and, and Allman just flat out calls her, well, not flat out, but he just about flat out calls her crazy. Everything but crazy, he says. Well, it's understandable for someone to imagine such things. Oh, Lord. So he's telling her that basically she had like a psychotic episode or something. What the hell? Oh my God. And like, mm, so many questions. So many questions. So, you know, y'all tell me what you think in the comments. I'm saying what I think in this video, but like, I don't want that. I don't want my opinion to like contaminate your opinion. Maybe you've got a better uh, kind of understanding of this than I do. I'm confused. I know what I think. Like I said, I think Wendy is batshit crazy. Um, but I don't even think it's like what the Wendy theory says. The Wendy theory, that damn video that has all those viewers and all those comments. I'll just say it out loud. I don't think that all, I think that a lot of those are bots in the comments. I I don't think that that's, that's an authentic channel. I think that all of those subscribers are purchased. Um, you know, there are companies that sell subscribers and followers for social media. I'm obviously not using them because, you know, if I, if I did, I'd have more than four, four, 417 subscribers. That's just sad, but you know, and I've been at this for a year. Um, so, but yeah, there's like no other I know I know it's probably a popular video but I still don't believe it's that popular I, st I a lot of accounts do this a lot of accounts um use bots they buy followers and then they those those bought like I said b-o-t and b-o-u-g-h-t bought and bought followers and then they they leave comments under videos find a very popular video by a very popular youtuber one of those that has millions and millions of subscribers come on seriously um and then look at the comments you're gonna find comments repeated by different accounts comment you're gonna find comments repeated over and over again at least like a couple of times i found it i've seen it and I said, oh, Jesus Christ, that's what's going on? Okay, cool. But, um, you know, whatever's going on. I know, like, uh, Tankard has his theory about the Wendy video. And I'm not talking about that, really. I'm just talking about, like, the hype. And I think partially it's, like, manufactured hype with, with those um, subscribers. Maybe, Tankard, maybe you're right about, like, the real author of the Wendy theory or whatever. I don't know. I, I'm not sure about that. That part I'm not really sure about, but the promotion of that video, obviously like a lot of creators, content creators, they'll buy subscribers just to give their channel that boost in the algorithm. Because like, obviously they don't pay a, any attention to you unless you have at least a thousand, maybe closer to like a couple thousand followers and getting those followers or subscribers 
organically, like, you know, the without paying for them, it's like pulling teeth. Like it, it's, it's, it's horrible. And a lot of the people I interact with are low um, subscriber count uh, channels. And that's why, because like, we're not willing to cheat. We're, we're not willing to pay money for that, but never mind. That's my little rant. That's my little tangential rant, but you know, this is it, right? This is, I guess, page 644 of this Teshin book. So, ooh, like I said, this hotel is open four months out of the year. Seriously. And then we get into this. Okay, this, like, when I saw this, Lord, and I don't know if this is like a film still or just a production photo of, of the little boy, Danny Lloyd, in his costume for this part of the movie. And here's another one, black and white photo. Um, like I think the same door is behind him, uh, maybe, yeah, and there he is holding this ball, this tennis ball, and it's a tennis ball, okay, it's not like a basketball, it's not a baseball, it's not nothing like that, it is a tennis ball, we see a baseball in the Torrance's apartment in Boulder, um, like when T Wendy and to Wendy and Tony, no, uh, Wendy and Danny are having their peanut butter jelly sandwich lunch. There is a baseball on the shelf behind them, um, behind like the table where they're eating. That's a baseball. And that's very clearly a baseball. This is very clearly a tennis ball. It cannot be interpreted any other way. And, you know, it's a tennis ball here, whether it's pink or yellow, don't matter, but it's a tennis ball. Um, and tennis what did I say? Y'all, I hope you're listening. Let me just, let me just focus on this. Actually, let me just focus on this for a second. What did I say in like, oh Lord, you're going to have to scroll down for a bit. I've been doing this for, I've been doing this for a year. I've made a lot of videos, not as many as like, maybe I would have liked to have made, but there he is. Understanding the shiny part one, um, pest control and the bloody writing on the wall. Um, understanding the shining part two house cleaning made easy and like the, that those are my first two part one and part two and then we go from there um and like i said in one of those either one or two i'm not sure but with jack walking into his interview when he comes into the hotel for the interview and i said there's this couple that walk past him as he's entering the hotel he's entering the lobby and it's a man and a woman young people attractive people and they're dressed to pl to play tennis, all right? The man and the woman and the lady. Hold on, let me just... No, I can't do it now. I don't have that kind of time. But the lady is dressed for tennis. She's wearing a visor, and they have tennis rackets. And I said, I did not see any tennis courts. You know? And I was talking about, like, you can't see a maze. In the front of the hotel, there's that, like, really narrow parking lot, and then that edge that you can just very easily uh, fall into if, if you forget that your car is in gear and you press the gas. Like, there you go. Um, that's in front of the hotel. In the back of the hotel, they it's impossible for the maze to be back there either because it slopes upward towards the mountaintop. And we saw that maze. It's flat as a pancake when Wendy and Danny are going through it and everything. No, that, that there is no conceivable way, logically, that that maze could exist on the grounds of the hotel. And we don't see any recreational nothing. I say that in the video, and I've repeated that a couple of times throughout my videos. There's no maze, in my opinion. There's no swimming pool. There's no tennis court. There's no basketball court. There's no spa. There's no restaurant. Like, they have a kitchen, but they don't have a dining room, as far as we know, at this hotel. They have the gold room. I don't I don't count that as a dining room. That's like a party room. It's got a bar, it's got a bandstand, and it's 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 like a nightclub in there. That's not a dining room. That's not where people eat their breakfast or lunch or dinner or whatever. Like I said, I think this place is a brothel. That's probably the gold room is probably where the men go and pick out like their companion for the evening or whatever. Or maybe it's not just male um, visitors or customers. You know what I mean, right? Uh, but they that's probably where they go and pick out the companion for the evening. 
Um, that's not a dining hall. That's a club. That's a pickup spot. There's no, I, I didn't see like any tables and chairs that are intended solely for the purpose of people sitting down and having their meals. The gold room is a club. The gold room is like for dancing and having, you know, mixed drinks or whatever. And, you know, it's a pickup scene and that's that. So no spa, no restaurant, no tennis court, no pool, no, um, no maze, nothing. What do they do there? What do they do at this hotel? There's no shops. There's no restaurants. There's no theaters. There's nowhere that tourists can just like go and walk around and, you know, see a show or go to a museum or go do some shopping. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay. And like I said, the woman and the man, when Jack walks into the hotel, right when he walks in, before he even gets to the reception desk to ask the girl behind the reception desk where Stuart Ullman's office is, th those two people are walking past and they've got tennis courts. I mean, tennis court, no. They've got tennis rackets. The lady, especially, I think. If not the man, then definitely the lady has a tennis racket and a visor. <sighs> Where are they going to play tennis? Where? And like I said, where's the thing? Where's the thing? Um, no, not that one. Here it is. So Stanley already, way before we see um, Jack messing around with the tennis ball and bouncing it up against the wall in the Colorado, Colorado lounge or the lobby or throwing it down into the hallway or when we see the ball roll to Danny in the hallway in front of room 237. Like, before any of that, before we see any tennis ball, we see that lady with the tennis racket. So Stanley, Stanley did it again. Stanley, Stanley, Stanley. He did it again. Right? We saw that woman with the tennis racket. We weren't even thinking. Like, what, the first time you watched that movie, you weren't even thinking, like, about that lady and her visor and her athletic clothing, at least for, you know, for the time period that was considered athletic clothing for a woman, um, and the tennis racket. Like, you didn't think, where are they going with that? Where are they going to play tennis? Nothing. And then the, the ball that Jack throws around and then is rolled to Danny in this hallway and then finally is given to him, thrown at him by Stuart Ullman in this epilogue scene that was, I guess, cut out by Stanley, is a tennis ball. Seriously. I don't know, y'all. I don't know. So I wanted to concentrate on the tennis ball for a second, right? And I wish I could see, for some reason, the, the brand of the um, tennis ball is obscured. I think it's Wilson. Is it Wilson? Is that the company for tennis balls? I haven't played tennis in a long time, and I never memorized the brand of the um, the the makers of, of the ball. I think it's Wilson, though. Correct me if I'm wrong. I used to play with them a lot when I was a kid. I was just kind of like Jack, I, but, but I, I didn't do it in the house. My mother would have killed me. So I would do that like outside, like on the garage door, you know, in the driveway. That's what I did. Not indoors, outdoors. Uh, ooh. Anyway, so, and so that's it. That's all I'm going to say about the tennis ball. Um, and then Danny's costume here, his, his outfit. Look at this. He's wearing more or less the same version, the, the pajamas version for a five year old, the pajamas version of what his father was wearing in the last part of the movie. Okay. So Jack is wearing blue jeans, a blue button-up shirt tucked into his jeans, those yellow, for all intents and purposes, yellow Timberland-style boots. They look like a construction worker's, like, sort of boots. And he's wearing that burgundy red jacket on top of everything. And I always wondered why he's wearing a jacket indoors. Never made sense to me. Um... 
really, really never made sense to me, but he's wearing a jacket indoors. So here's Danny wearing those same colors and that same setup, but like in, in pajama and robe form for a kid. This is basically his father's color scheme. That's what he was wearing when he lost his mind in that part of the um, movie. Okay? And that's what he wears when he's chasing Danny around in the maze. That's what he wears when he's busting the door in with the axe. That's what he wears when he's in the gold room talking to Lloyd and then with all the other people, the party, you know, the phantom um, party goers. That's what he's wearing. The blue... Uh, shirt and pants and the red burgundy red jacket and this this color red that Danny's got on this is a deep red this is a deep red what the hell and now let me go back to the image of Wendy where is it again these are Wendy's colors Danny's cut co these are not Danny's colors these are not Jack's colors like I said Jack is like green and brown um Jack is green and brown. Wendy is red and blue, and usually the feet are yellow. Whether they're moccasins or Ugg boots or whatever, they're usually yellow. And if they're not yellow, like we saw in part 15, they're, they're red with those boots that I said, why is she wearing rain boots indoors? Um, mm. And now Danny. And, and we've seen Danny in Wendy's colors a couple of times in the movie. This is just like further emphasis of that in this scene that got cut out. So what is this talking about? Is this, is this talking about like Wendy's like very strong influence on Danny? Or is Wendy just doing his mother's bidding? Or like what the, what in the world is going on? What this is like when I saw this image of this outfit that they put him in, I said, Oh my God. He's dressed exactly like his father when his father, I mean, almost exactly the same color scheme and the same, like, you know, the, the shell part of the outfit, the jacket is like, this is basically the same shade as his father's jacket, the burgundy one. And then underneath the blue, what the hell? What the hell? And he's got... Ullman gives him the, the tennis ball. And I mentioned tennis because... Let me go back to the picture of Ullman here. Tennis is... I mean, what kind of game is tennis? That ball goes back and forth in tennis. Like, I guess it's Danny's serve now, right? As they say. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I've, I've been talking for almost an hour, and I said I would try to make this a short video. I apologize for lying to you. I, I, I didn't think it would be this long. I really didn't. But, y'all, I'm, I'm going to leave it on this picture, because this picture is just, like, everything. Everything. Like I said, tell me about this lamp. What do you think is going on with this lamp? If you've ever worked in a hospital or whatever, what's going on with the lamp? Should there be a light bulb in there? Let me know. Tell me about this picture. I cannot, for the life of me, make it out. It looks like maybe, I want to say, it, it looks very reminiscent to me, but I can't see it very well. It looks very reminiscent of Picasso's Guernica. I don't know what y'all think, but, you know, it's obviously a print. Um, but you all let me know what you think. And with all that being said, <laughs> I think I've said enough for this one. Yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts, your insights. Um, if you think I got something wrong, let me know. You know, be polite. I, I'm polite with you all. I, except that one time, like Chuck just, ooh. I really went in on Chuck, but everybody else I've been okay with. So y'all, let me know if you think I'm wrong. I'm open to it. I'm open to new ideas. Uh, and other than that, I think I'm done for this video. I'm almost up on, on an hour. Um, I'm going to be, you know, working on some stuff, going to be trying to get part 16 out uh, and done as soon as I possibly can. But let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, until next time, you all. Until 
the next time when I find yet another reason to talk at you. Part 16, Colorado Lounge, the number 42, God knows what else. Uh, until that next time, I am going to go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So, bye-bye, everybody.